Welcome back everybody. In this tutorial, you are going to learn the fundamentals of transfer learning for convolutional neural networks in the PyTorch framework. Let's get started. So before we do a couple of bookkeeping announcements. So first of all, this is not my code. This is an abbreviation of the uh, PyTorch tutorial, which you can see here before you by Sasink. Chulam Kurthi. I'm totally butchering that name and I apologize for that, but uh, I will leave a link for the uh, tutorial here in the description. Second thing, my new course, Deep Q Learning from uh, Paper to Code, is on sale for the next five days at the $9.99 price point. That's how I support the channel through my course sales, so if you want to get in on the action, please click the link in the description and or pin comment. But enough of that, let's get to the code. But before we get to the code, uh, I forgot to mention that you will need to download the data for this particular project from the link on the tutorial. Uh, we are going to be classifying ants versus bees, which is a pretty cool application of an image classifier. Okay, now let's get to the code. All right, so the imports are pretty voluminous, so we will need OS for path operations. Uh, we will need, of course, torch. We will need uh, torch.nn. We will need torch.optim for our optimizer. We will need uh, the torch vision package. So we'll need torch vision transforms. Uh, torch vision.transforms import to tensor. We will need uh, also uh, import torch vision.transforms as transforms. This will handle uh, transformations of the image because we're not going to have a really large data set. So we're going to have to do some basic transformations to kind of multiply our data. We will need uh, torch vision models and the data sets. Okay, so we're going to have several different functions to deal with. So we will need a function to handle uh, setting the require grad flag for each of the parameters. And the reason we want to do that is because we're going to use a ResNet model as a feature extractor. So if you're not familiar with convolutional neural networks, the basic idea is you have a CNN, a convolutional neural network that uh, basically scans over the image, selects features from it that it thinks are relevant for feeding into a classifier. So what we're going to do is we're going to freeze the lower layers of the network, which are the convolutional layers, which have learned from you know a wide data set. And then we're going to train the last two layers, which are two fully connected layers uh, on the current data set, which is the ants versus bees. So we need a function to handle freezing the lower layers of the convolutional neural network to facilitate that. We'll also need a function to train the model and a main function to tie everything together. So let's get started with that. Set parameter requires grad. That'll take a model as input. That'll be a ResNet model in this case. And it's just a Boolean parameter called extracting. So if we are extracting, then we want to iterate over our model parameters. Param in model parameters. Param dot requires grad equals false. So what this does is it detaches the parameters of the model from the graph, so it doesn't do any gradient descent operations on it. That's what it means to kind of freeze to not do gradient descent on those particular parameters. So next we have our function to train the model. And that takes many inputs, uh, the first of which is the model we want to use, the data loaders, the criterion, an optimizer, and a number of epochs, which we will default to 25. Let me scroll down for you. So we're gonna jump right into iterating over our epochs using the proper indentation, of course. And we're gonna print some debug information at the top of the loop. Let us know how far we are along. And we're going to print some uh, hyphens just to make things look pretty. And then we're going to iterate over the training and validation phases.
if phase is train, then what we want to do is set model.train. Otherwise, we want to set model.eval. And the reason we do this is because when PyTorch is in training mode, it is collecting statistics for batch normalization. And when it is in eval mode, it is not doing that. There are some other operations that are handled differently in train and eval, but those are the, uh, the one that comes to mind from my memory. So we need to uh, make sure that we deal with that using this conditional statement. Next, we have a couple variables to keep track of our running loss as well as the total number of uh, correct guesses. Next, we're going to iterate over the inputs and labels in our data loaders. Now, if you're not familiar with the data loader, the data loader is just uh, kind of what the name indicates. It is a an object that handles loading of data. In this case, it will load from the directory a uh, sequence of images that we're going to perform a series of transformations on, which we'll define uh, shortly. Let's scroll down first. Now, the first thing we need to do is send our inputs and labels to our device. That's because PyTorch is quite particular about the types of tensors you're dealing with. If you do not declare a tensor to be on the GPU, then it automatically assumes it's on the CPU. And if you attempted to mix it with a tensor from the GPU, it gives you an error. So we have to be very pedantic about where we send stuff. Inputs to device. Device. And of course, every time you uh, enter a training loop in PyTorch, you want to zero your gradient for your optimizer. After zeroing out our gradients, we're going to use a context manager to set the gradients to either enabled or disabled based on our mode. So we don't want to calculate gradients when we're in validation mode, only in training mode. And we do that like so. And now we're going to get the um, uh, feed forward for our model and calculate our loss. And then we want to get the predicted class for our outputs. And if we are training, we want to uh, back propagate and step our optimizer. Then we want to uh, keep track of our running loss and number of correct predictions. Plus equals. Now, since the loss is a PyTorch tensor and running loss is a float, we have to dereference the tensor with dot item. That just gives us the NumPy data out. And multiply by the uh, input size. And then we want to calculate the sum of where the predictions equal the labels.data. That gives us the total number of correct predictions. And at the end of each epoch, we want to keep track of the total epoch loss as well as the total epoch accuracy. So let me scroll down so you can see that. So we'll say epoch loss equals running loss divided by the length of the data loader's phase.data set. And we're going to define that in a few moments. Now, if you are unfamiliar with this dot double function here, all this does is convert the tensor to float 64, a double precision tensor. And this is probably to do with the uh, PyTorch peculiarities of particular being quite particular about the different types of data types so uh, it probably expects a float 64 at some point so we're just turning it into one now next we handle some basic uh, print statements for losses and accuracies for f for precision 
accuracy uh, format phase epoch loss accuracy and let's go ahead and clean that up and that wraps up our data function so now let's go ahead and code up the main loop to tie everything together And we define a root directory for our data. That's in the Hymenoptera data directory and you need the forward slash at the end. Next, we're gonna define a series of image transforms. And as I stated earlier, the purpose of this is to A, turn an image into a tensor. That's a very important operation. It can't, uh, PyTorch doesn't deal with raw tensors, sorry, raw images. They have to be transformed into tensors. We're also going to normalize, basically convert it to a grayscale, resize and do a random rotation to kind of multiply our data set. And the point of that is that if you have a small amount of data, you can multiply the data by doing a number of operations. You can resize, uh, resizing is for, you know, making sure everything is the same size, but the rotations help you turn one image into many, right? And particularly if you do it by a random angle. And that is a dictionary with two keys, train and validate. And it takes an array of transforms. And I've chosen minus 270 to plus 270 degrees. And we will do a resize. Uh, 224 by 224 and I believe that is uh, what the ResNet model expects as input. Transforms out two tensor but I honestly could be wrong about that so don't quote me but that's what my recollection is. Forms out normalize mean equals 0.485.4 Four five six zero dot four zero six with a standard deviation of nine and five. And this also may be a peculiarity of what the model expects as input. So next we want to handle our validation transforms. And unless I am mistaken, those are pretty much identical. So let's make a new key. Val and I am clearly forgetting something here. So I'm clearly missing something as indicated by the funny colors. So it looks like I need a parenthesis here and a period there, perfect. So now we can just copy this, paste it there and do that. So that should be correct. I guess we'll find out when I go to run it. So next we have to handle the data generator. This is just going to be a generator object that maps the transforms to the images we're gonna load from the directory of data that we downloaded from the tutorial. Relatively straightforward, we are just opening up an image folder data set and performing the transforms by iterating over the keys and train and validate. Of course, every data generator needs a data loader as well. That takes our data generator as input batch size of two. And we certainly wanna shuffle. Num workers handles the number of threads we dedicate to it, we'll call it four. K in train and val. Next we handle uh, instantiating our device and model.
So if you have a GPU, you want to use it almost certainly. Otherwise, we just default to the CPU. Let's scroll down. So this will take several minutes. Uh, the tutorial indicates something like 20 minutes on a CPU. It runs in about under a minute on my GPU. So now we have a uh, our model, which will be the ResNet 18. And we're going to make sure to use the pre-trained version. And then we want to set the parameters requires grad. And we are passing in a value of true. This might be a little bit confusing. Uh, let's scroll back up to uh, parse what this means. So if extracting is true, then we want to set requires grad to false. So the uh, <laughs> the nomenclature here they chose for this tutorial is a little bit unfortunate. We're not setting requires grad to true. We're setting it to false, but uh, okay, fine. So I hope that's relatively clear. So after setting our uh, parameters require grad, we have to deal with the question of how to handle the linear classifier that we're going to stick on top of our pre-trained Resident 18 model. So we're going to do that by finding out how many parameters we have because the uh, convolutional ne neural network acts as a feature extractor and will output some number of features which will serve as input for our linear layers and then we know we have two classes so we only have two outputs so let's do that and that's model dot fully connected dot in features remember the resident 18 model already comes with a pre-trained uh, fully connected layer but we're going to just overwrite that right here with a two output linear classifier and make sure to send it to our device. Now we need our criterion. Which is a cross entropy loss, which is what we use for multi-class classification. And we need our optimizer as well. And that will optimize the model parameters with a learning rate of 0 0.001 using the atom optimizer. Scroll down. And next, before we actually handle the model training, we want to do a bit of a sanity check to make sure that we uh, are actually going to be updating the model parameters that we think we are. So we'll say params to update is an empty list for name param in. model name parameters. If the requires grad is true, then print them to the terminal. All right, finally, we want to go ahead and start training our model. Okay, so let's go ahead and head to the terminal and see how it all works. All right, moment of truth. Uh, of course, I only have a single equal sign. Let's fix that. So that is all the way up here. And that is an obvious silly one. All right. Let's go ahead and head back to the terminal and see what else I messed up. Try it again. Generator expression must be parenthesized if not sole argument. Okay, let's take a look at that. That's on line 68. So that is down here. Ah, I see it. So I have forgotten a parenthesis there and I placed it there by mistake. All right. And actually, I think then there's probably a mistake here as well. No, here's my closing parenthesis. All right, let's go back to the terminal and see how it does. Once more.
Perfect. So you can see it prints out FC weight and FC bias. Uh, those are the parameters to update. And then it starts training 25 epochs. And you can see in general, it's kind of going up and down. Accuracy of around 90% or so on the validation set. And it looks like there is a little bit of uh, under training where it is do, uh, underfitting the data. It is underfitting the training data and doing better on the validation data. So that's not too terrible for a tiny data set and no real, you know, model tuning in a pre-trained model. So that is the gist of uh, transfer learning. Uh, just to recap what we have done here, what we have done is to take a pre-trained ResNet 18 model and freeze the lower layers, the convolutional layers, which serve as feature extractors for our images. And then we uh, train the uh, upper layers, which are the fully connected layers that handle the actual image classification. On a relatively modest data set, uh, we could increase the data set size by doing more uh, more transforms. And in particular, we might want to get rid of the rotation and use, Im use image flipping because if it's, uh, a mirror image is just as good as the original image. And it's probably better to flip than to do random rotations on stuff like this. Because if you visualize it, you'll see the random rotation actually introduces some kind of distortions in the image that may very well confound our convolutional neural network. Who knows? So I hope this was helpful. Make sure to subscribe, leave a comment down below, a like, hit the bell icon because I know only 14% of you are getting my notifications and I'll see you in the next video.